So this is a broad way of looking at this, is 43% across the board. And that means, uh, that means the entitlements, uh, Medicaid, uh, Medicare, Social Security. If you'd like, we can drill down on all, these, uh, on all these issues and how that might actually be accomplished. But we've got to embark on a serious reform in all these areas if they're going to be viable, if they're going to actually help individuals in, in need. Uh, but we've got to do it, and we've got to do it now. Interest on the debt right now is, uh, is the fifth largest ticket item in the budget at about a quarter of a, of a, uh, a, quarter of a trillion dollars, $250 billion, and interest rates are at uh, 2%. Uh, if interest rates just go back to historical norms, uh, and if the debt increases to uh, 15 billion over the next couple of years, which it's going to do, uh, interest on the debt alone is going to be almost as what, almost what we're spending on uh, defense spending today. And then talking about defense, um, I believe in a strong national defense. I think that it's one of the obligations that this country has constitutionally is to provide us with a strong national defense. But I don't know about a strong national defense for the rest of the world. Um, I think that we're nation building worldwide when we have our own nation to build. Uh, I would have been on record prior to us going into Iraq saying, hey, we, we don't need to do this. We have the military surveillance capability to see Iraq roll out any weapons of mass destruction. If that would have happened, I thought we could have gone in and had a military strike against that happening. I thought if we went into Iraq, we would find ourselves in a civil war to which there would be no end. And Afghanistan, talking about a military strike, um, I thought that initially that's exactly what that was and that it was completely warranted, that it was against Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, but they're not there anymore and we're entering into our 10th year of engagement in Afghanistan. We need out of Afghanistan and we need out of Afghanistan uh, now. We're building, <laughs> we're building roads, schools, bridges, highways, and hospitals in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we're borrowing 43 cents out of every dollar to do this. We're spending more money on defense spending than all the other countries in the world combined, and we're 5% of the world's population. This is, this is 2010. The world reality today is we can't continue to be the world sheriff. We can't afford it. Uh, we're bankrupt. So uh, talking now and shifting gears a little bit back to free markets, believing in free markets when it comes to, when, when it comes to everything. You know what? You either buy into free markets or you don't buy into free markets. And I believe that lower costs for goods and services benefits everybody. And so you either buy into it or you don't buy into it. So in schools, I see that as, as, as a real potential when it comes to school choice. When it comes to health care, when the health care debate started, to, to me, here was an opportunity to bring the free market to bear on health care. And by the way, health care in this country, I don't think could be any further removed from free market than it currently is. But the opportunity that government had was, was to actually remove impediments for healthcare entrepreneurs that wanted to get into the space and deliver better products, better services at lower prices. Really blow the lid off of supply. Advertise pricing. Uh, in a free market, in a free market healthcare system, I would not buy health insurance, general health insurance for myself. I would buy health insurance to cover catastrophic injury or illness. And in a true free market system, you, as a, as a consumer of insurance, you might want to exclude the fact that you want to get covered for, uh, for, for the chiropractor. You may want to exclude the fact that you might not want the acupuncturist. Uh, I, I would not check, I, I would want the acupuncturist. I, I just, but but, you, but you, might, you might get a real specialized um, insurance should you buy it in a, in a true free market system. I had stitches in Taos a couple of uh, winters ago. I had five stitches, and it took the doctor about 10 minutes to administer the five stitches, and the cost for the five stitches was 750 bucks. Now that's the cost for stitches. Well, I had no idea. 
Um, I just have to believe that if the government were embarked on, on true free market, opening up uh, uh, medical services like stitches, perhaps to physician's assistants, that there would have been a stitch clinic in Albuquerque that would have done those same stitches at 75 bucks. Now that's my belief. And if there would have been advertised pricing and I would have known about that, I'd have put a Band-Aid over my, over my cut and I would have driven down to Albuquerque and, and had those stitches done for 75 bucks. And when it comes to, when it comes to our own, if, if we were to pay as we went, you know, we'd go, we'd have our x-ray for $200 and, and yes, it aches, and you know what? There's a .005 possibility that that's cancer in there, and the only way we're gonna be able to detect that is with a $3,500 MRI. I'd say, I'm gonna take my chances that I'm okay with the x-ray, and then I'll go with the x-ray. But if it's, if it's a system where nobody pays but insurance, you know what? You're gonna end up having the MRI, and that's what we've got going right now. In a free market healthcare system, I had envisioned gallbladders are us, where <laughs> clinics would have specialized in gallbladder surgery. Maybe it was here in Austin, Texas. So everywhere, everybody in the country had to pay for an airline ticket to come to Austin to have gallbladder surgery at thousands of dollars as opposed to tens of thousands of dollars. We're getting on airplanes right now to have heart surgery at tens of thousands of dollars as opposed to hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then back to insurance. We, we, have, we have now an insurance entitlement program in this country. We're gonna end up dropping 30 million more Americans on a system with no added capacity. Is there any way that this is not gonna lead to rationing and higher costs? And when it comes to insurance, if I might draw an analogy between health insurance and grocery insurance. Why doesn't the government offer grocery insurance? They're so darn expensive. So we could just buy insurance to pay for groceries. Go into the grocery store. Well, now there's no pricing because nobody pays for, nobody individually pays for groceries. Grocery insurance does. I go to buy the evening, uh, um, evening meal, ground round, or fillets. Well, I really like fillets, and of course, I don't uh, have to pay for fillets. Grocery insurance does, and I go to the checkout stand, and what has really happened to the prices? Well, prices have been jacked out the roof by the owner of the grocery store because nobody pays for groceries. Grocery insurance does. I think that that's the analogy. Another issue, another issue of the day. Um, Immigration. Um, I really believe that this country uh, has been founded on immigration. I really think that immigration is a good thing. Uh, I think that as a result of having hardworking immigrants in this, in this country that we actually create potentially millions of jobs because amongst the immigrants that come into this country are plenty of entrepreneurs that, that start up businesses and end up generating millions of jobs. And right now, uh, we're educating uh, foreign students, and because of our immigration policy, we're actually sending them back. And uh, potentially, uh, they're going to be competitors to the United States with the millions of jobs in those countries as opposed to here. But we do have a, an illegal immigration problem. And I think, uh, I think the solution is, is that we make it really easy for an immigrant that wants to come into this country to get a legal work visa. A legal work visa, a background check, social security card so that taxes get paid, income tax, social security, uh, Medicaid. Um, and when it comes to the 11 million illegal immigrants that are here right now in this country, George Bush called it amnesty, I'll call it a grace period. Amnesty, when I say grace period, not citizenship not citizenship, never has meant citizenship. It's just a period of time whereby we can get citizens that are here, we, where we can get illegal immigrants signed up to be legal immigrants, work visa. Understanding that the government is the number one contributor to why we have 11 million illegal immigrants here in this country today. It's impossible to get a work visa. It's impossible to get a work visa. So. 
Uh, Mexicans that are coming over the border have dozens of friends or relatives that are working in the United States. They're working illegally, but they need work, so they come over illegally, and they can't get a work visa. Would they stand in line if there were uh, a line for work visas? Yes, they would. Uh, and really, that's the solution. And then once you do that, once you set up a grace period um, at, to do this, make a work visa easy to come by, then concentrate law enforcement on immigrants that are here illegally. And if you're caught one time, you know what? You're going to get deported and you're never going to come back into this country and work. The notion of building an impenetrable fence across 1,600 miles of border I figured out it's going to cost about $200 billion, and, um, and that isn't going to include maintenance. The notion of putting the National Guard arm in arm across 1,600 miles of border, in my opinion, would end up to be a whole lot of money spent with little or no benefit at all. And then as a comprehensive part of immigration reform, not only do we need to determine what it is to be a citizen, and by the way, none of these 11 million illegal immigrants that are here in this country right now are going to jump the line when it comes to citizenship. Never. That's never going to happen. We're just talking about a work visa. Uh, but none of them are going to jump the line. And then also, uh, immigration reform needs to say that immigration is about work. It's not about welfare. And then we need to have welfare reform in this country because the notion that Mexican citizens or that uh, illegal immigrants, immigrants, are taking U.S. jobs is, is completely false. It's not happening. And it's because, it's because of the U.S. government. It's because we have a welfare state where you can sit at home and make a little bit less money or the same amount of money by sitting at home. And that should not be the case. It should be an incentive to take an entry-level job. And an entry-level job is just that. It's an entry-level job. Everybody that takes an entry-level job moves up from an entry-level job. And then coming back to marijuana. Legalized marijuana and arguably 75% of the border violence goes away when it comes to Mexico. That's the... <laughs> That's the estimate of Mexican drug cartels' activities that revolve around uh, marijuana. 28,000 deaths south of the border over the last four years. If we can't connect the dots between violence and prohibition today, I don't know if we ever will be able to. Prop 19 in California. It failed, uh, but I got to tell you, it didn't fail at all. It put the issue on the dinner table for millions of Americans to talk about every single night. It was on the media every single day in a way that it's never been on before. A Gallup poll a couple of days ago came out. 46% of Americans support legalizing marijuana. That issue is just a couple of years off from being at a tipping point. So this is all really good stuff. And it was, and it, and, and, and when it comes to the marijuana issue, discussing it, uh, talking about it, it does really well with a little bit of water, with a little bit of sunlight. People understand. They really come to grips with this. So in December, I formed Our America Initiative. Uh, I've been to 31 states. Uh, I've gotten to address hundreds of groups. And thank you very much for having me here today and taking your time to be here. But I wouldn't be here if I didn't think that what I'm saying needs to be said, and I wouldn't be here if it was being said. It's not. Um, you know, I was on Neil Cavuto a couple of days ago, and uh, one of the storylines, and this is what I said uh, on his show, one of the storylines was Republicans are calling for immediate repeal of Obamacare. And I said, you know, that's exactly what needs to happen. But in the spirit of bipartisanship, how about if the Republicans offer up a repeal of the prescription health care benefit that was passed while they were in control of the White House and Congress? I mean, if there is an opportunity right now to right the financial ship, uh, it's now. And there's no more kicking the can down the road. It does need to happen now. And again, we have this opportunity. Write the financial ship and return this country to what it's always been about, 
which is liberty and freedom and, and the personal responsibility that goes along with that. So, questions, comments? Yes. Thank you.